welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today. We're here with Kim Lee, a 30 years experience CG artist. Uh, and he, we're going to go and walk through the, the, the trials and tribulations, the pain of being a CG artist in the industry and how to survive it and some, some life notes too. So get out your notepad, write this stuff down. Kim, welcome. Uh, welcome. Thank you for joining us, sir. Thank you, DaCosta. Hey guys, how's everybody doing? Uh, like he's like DaCosta said, my name is Kim Lee and I will be your host for the next 45 minutes or so. Um, thank you for having me. I hope everybody's enjoying uh, Lightbox Expo and having a good time and getting some great info from all the talks. Uh, I got a chance to see Todd's talk a little bit before mine. Um, so anyway, I'm going to jump right into it. Just wanted to start off with the camera so you can see who the hell is talking to you guys. So let me just share my screen and make sure you guys see this correctly. Uh, DaCosta, is that looking okay? Looking good, sir. Yep. Okay. So let's get right into it because mine is kind of jam packed with content and I want to make sure I don't go over time and get cut off. So, uh, so my talk obviously is how I survived 30 years as a 3D artist. Um, again, Kim Lee, CG supervisor currently at Fuse Effects New York. Um, so let's talk first about me so you know why I'm talking to you. So I'm currently CG supervisor at Fuse Effects New York and I was previously CG generalist there. I've been at the company just over six and a half years now, um, based in New York. And I'm also the co-founder organizer of 3D NY meetup group, which uh, before the pandemic, we met every month in New York City for basically anybody uh, who's into doing 3D. Uh, we usually meet in a bar and we have presentations and stuff like that. Um, so a community thing. So let's take a look at the reel just so you can see what kind of work that I've done and then we can get into how I got here and the lessons learned. So let me just hit play. And this is um, one of the New York reels for Fuse Effects. You guys seen that? Yeah, that's good. And that 
is the real. Right. Can I just interject with wow? Sure. <laughs> I'm sorry, say that again? Yeah. Wow. I just want oh. to say wow. Oh, thanks. <laughs> well, the team effort. That is not all me. Um, and for any of this kind of work, it never is. So I want to just kind of fire quickly through my first few slides of this just to, uh, to get to the meat of things. But this is more about just to give you some background of, of where I came from, how I got you know, to a certain point before I started learning lessons. So uh, my early inspiration when I was a kid, and now we're talking about when I was like you know, 10 years old to 12 years old, um, I, I was inspired by what I saw on television, which uh, at the time, Sinbad movies, a lot of stop motion animation, anything by Ray Harry Hobson, um, Christmas specials, anything by Rankin and Bass, which I found out later who made these, and stuff like Davy and Goliath. And um, the reason I liked all these things is because they felt tangible. Like it was not like just normal cartoons. So I was really taken by the physicality of the images I was seeing. It was like my toys come to life. Um, obviously, like so many others, uh, in 1977, when Star Wars came out and I saw it, my dad took me to it. I was blown away. It totally changed my life. And I remember watching the Death Star sequence thinking, I want to be able to give this feeling to other people, the feeling that I'm feeling. So um, I read everything I could about Star Wars, found out about behind the scenes stuff. Uh, that introduced me to the use of model making um, and motion control. Uh, pretty, you know, cool concepts for, a, you know, a kid who's like, you know, Less, younger than 15. Um, that kind of, actually, let me go back to that. That made me want to start doing stop motion animation and working with models. Uh, but at the time, you really had to have a lot of skill sets to do that. You had to be able to make an armature, make puppets. You might, to do it right, you had to know mold making, working with latex and rubber. Um, you had to know about lights and you had to have access to lights and cameras and things like that. And the, the process of stop motion animation was quite daunting for a kid who's 12 years old. But I tried what I, you know, I could try with the limited resources I had. Um, but time passes and I went on to other things. So later in life, um, I had always wanted a video game console back this is back in the early days of the ataris atari 2600 gaming consoles and my parents would never get one for me and my brother but what they did do instead uh with a lot of wisdom was get us our first computer so technically i started on the 8-bit computers of the ataris and we quickly moved up to the atari st computers i'm going to kind of fly through this this slide because this is more just about where i came from getting introduced to the whole medium. So I started on a computer like that, the Atari ST. I discovered this software called CAD 3D, which ironically, later on in life, I found out it was written by the same people who wrote a later 3D studio. Um, this is what the interface looked like, just to give a little bit of a historical uh, perspective for uh, people who are working in the industry now. This is how things looked when we started. So it was really primitive, but I learned a lot. And then um, I eventually wanted to build a PC. And the reason I wanted to is because there were certain games coming out that weren't being written for the Ataris anymore. I couldn't afford a PC at the time. So what I did was I said, let me, let me piecemeal a PC together and buy parts when I can afford them. And that way I'll learn how these machines work and I can fix it. If, uh, if anything happens. And that was a very smart move on my part. So I, I, I got into building a PC so I could play these games. And then in some magazines that I would read, trade magazines like PC Magazine or anything about that, I would see these ads for a program called 3D Studio. Long story short, I got into that, got my parents to buy me a, an educational version of it. And I started my path down 3D. So uh, my first steps into this new field of playing with it, and of course, this is all hobby right now. This is all just a, you know, an interest of mine. Um, I was very fortunate 
not everybody has these opportunities, but uh, in my life, my dad happened to be a advertising art director. So I actually learned quite a bit from him, even though I never went to school for art. Um, I was pretty much self-taught and or family home taught <laughs> in that case. Um, I learned a lot about layout and typeface and stuff like that from my dad and drawing early on and things like that. But as I was learning 3D and I was playing with this 3D programs, all of this influence uh, affected what I was doing. I knew how to compose an image uh, and things of that nature. Also, when you start out in 3D, everybody, I've heard many over the years, whenever I give a talk, a lot of people ask, well, how do you get stuff for your reel if you're just starting out? You don't have any work to show. Well, you just make up work. And in my case, I was lucky enough that one of my close friends at the time, and now I'm into my, we're, now we're into, we've fast forwarded into my, my early 20s. Um, and I've been playing with 3D for, you know, I had just gotten back into playing 3D for like maybe a year or two. And one of my close friends that I had met in the neighborhood was an MTV director. And he was going on to direct a new show called uh, The John Stewart Show. And I was making up interstitials for that or making up commercials that didn't exist. And that was what I was putting on my reel. Um, also, my brother happened to be a production designer, and one of our early opportunities was he had this opportunity to pitch for, uh, I don't know what year it was, but there was they were trying to do the Ice Capades, Batman on Ice, and he got a, a chance to pitch some ideas. So he said, hey, this new 3D animation stuff you're doing, could you make renderings of our designs? to put into the package to present. So we started doing early renderings in very, you know, early 3D software of what this, the ice rink would look like with his lighting design and all that. Um, this was all stuff that went into my portfolio before I ever worked in the industry. So this was all stuff I was just doing on the side uh, as inspiration for material to make. You have this great tool that you can make stuff with the big question becomes not how do you make it now, is what do you make? So all these things were opportunities for me to have subject matter to focus on, to apply the skill set to. So soon after we started this Batman on Ice thing, we realized as he made it through many rounds of, of uh, pitching, we started saying, oh, my God, you might get this. You might actually get awarded this. We cannot look like a bunch of kids in a garage. We need to get our shit together. So we decided, well, maybe we need to start a company and be incorporated so that if this does happen, we're ready. And worst case scenario, we now have a company that we can do business through. So that's what we did. We started a company called Worlds Away Productions and more on that later. And that was the logo. So moving along, I, I want to talk a little bit about early networking. And this is, this is a theme that's important for everyone. Uh, no matter where you are in your career. But clearly it's key in the beginning that you realize this stuff is important. So in my case, I was able to talk my parents into, I had found out about this trade show, this industry trade show called SIGGRAPH. And I convinced my parents to, I had just put a reel together. I convinced them to pay for me to go there and go attend this show. So I went by myself with a, backpack full of VHS tapes of my of my reel back in the day. It's much easier today where we can just give a URL link. Um, this is what the convention center looked like back in 95 for the first SIGGRAPH. And there were this was before websites were everywhere. So this was the early days of the internet when it was mostly bulletin boards. And in my search for information about this field that I was interested in, I was scouring every source I could, bookstores, internet, for information about this. And one of the key places back in the day was this service called CompuServe. This is around the time AOL came to being as well. But this was also a bulletin board where all these major names were answering questions. And you, if you pay attention to any bulletin board, 
system or forum today. And certain names keep coming up that you see contributing or know the answer to things. I was making note of all of that. And I had a chance at SIGGRAPH to go meet these people and see the people behind the names on the forums. Um, this is a key thing that is, I think, really important and I hope doesn't get lost in today's online culture, where even though we have video chats and stuff like that, there is no, um, no, no replacement for meeting someone in person and spending time and talking to them. Um, and that's an early lesson I learned my very first SIGGRAPH was making connections with these people. They know who you are now. You are not just a name on a bulletin board system after the trade show. You are starting relationships with these people. Um, I also had a chance to go to a birds of a, birds of a feather uh, class that they have at um, SIGGRAPH, which was off campus. And um, again, I met more of the big names at the time for the software that I was using, which was 3D Studio DOS, right? Um, anyway, that was the, the people I met there. I maintain those relationships today. So this is important stuff. Um, also at that show, I met these people from New York. It seems that whenever you go to a trade show or any kind of event like this, people from a certain area tend to find each other. So I found all the New Yorkers. And some of the people that I met at the, at the show were telling me, hey, your reel looks great. You should come. We work at a company called Design Systems in, down in the West Village. You should come down and meet the boss and come play on our hardware. We, we're a reseller. We sell hardware and graphics software. And we sell silicon graphics machines and PCs and things like that. That's back when SGI was still a big name. So when I got back, I went and met them and I showed my reel to the boss and he goes, great. I, you know, I'd love to hire you, Kim. What I'd like to do is I'd like half your time to be sales. So you're selling software and hardware for part of the day. And then the rest of the day, I want you to make a reel for us because we don't want to just be a reseller in the future. We would like to actually do production work and do the service of 3D animation. So. I need you to make a reel like yours, but for us. So this was a great opportunity, I thought at the time, and I still do, because it, it, um, it exposed me to another side of the industry that I wasn't familiar with, which became key to my career. And that is the sales side. And I don't mean being a salesman, but all the connections being on the sales side and knowing the sales side gives you. I was able to now have people that I knew in Autodesk uh, on the sales side who knew me and they would connect me with their demo artists. So I would meet more people in the organization. Eventually it would turn into me meeting and uh, becoming friends with some of the actual software developers and the coders and the people behind the software and the development of it, which became key to my career moving forward. So most of you guys out there are probably just artists, which is great. I just want you to take from this the fact that there's other people working in the industry, not in your particular field, like as an artist, who it's good to know everybody in the entire ecosystem. Um, it will actually benefit you greatly. Um, and we're going to actually touch on that later about um, fostering relationships with people in the industry who do not do what you do. So this kind of led to me becoming um, proficient at being a demo artist. Uh, and, the, and the really good things that come out of that are you get very good at demonstrating and communicating concepts quickly in an engaging way. So even though I wasn't thinking that when I was doing demo artist stuff, that was a skill set that I was developing so that I could communicate fast, show some whiz bang, ooh, ooh, ah stuff that was pertinent to the people who were watching it. Um, also, at that time, I founded, along with two other gentlemen that I had met in the community, we started a user group in New York because we were like, 
why is there no user group here? Well, let's just start one. Um, the good stuff about this beyond it, just bringing the community together and finding the people in your area that you don't know are doing the same things you're trying to do and try to learn, bringing them all together. It was also really important because both the demo artist part of it and the user group part really helped me develop my public speaking uh, skill set, which is a, a skill set that has served me greatly in the last 30 years and, and would help anybody in any area of this industry. It's still a useful skill set. Even if you never do public speaking, it'll help you with your team, things like that. So, uh, and this is the, the current logo for the user group, which hasn't been running so much lately, but we'll see what the future brings. So <clears throat> let's talk now about my first big break. When I was at Design System Selling, I, there was a, a sale that came up on, on a plugin for 3D Studio Max, because Max was out now. And uh, one of the calls that I had to make was to a company called Curious Pictures and a gentleman named Ian Christie, who was the senior animator at Curious Pictures at the time. And I told him about the offer. He said, sure, sign me up. I'll order a, a seat of it. Great. I made note of where they were located. I said, oh, these guys are like two blocks away. I'm not going to just have this drop ship to them. I'm actually going to hand deliver this when this comes in. And I had just finished making a reel for the company. So I was like, well, boss told me he wants me to bring a reel to them too, in case there's overflow work. Maybe we can help Curious Pictures with something. Well, long story short, I go there, give them a software. That was the smartest thing I ever did. I gave them the reel. A couple of days later, after they showed their boss the reel, I got called saying, hey, we want to talk to you. Um, they wanted to hire me through design systems to start working with them a little and helping them out. I did that. Um, I thought it was great. So at this time, I'm working for design systems, but going two blocks away to work for Curious Pictures. Clearly and obviously, after a certain amount of time, I started realizing, hey, I could just freelance directly for them. Why am I working for design systems and getting paid only this much while they're charging uh, Curious Pictures this much? So I talked to my boss about it. He was very, very cool. And he says, yeah, it's time to let you fly away. You know, you're, you've outgrown us now. Well, you have our blessings, you can leave. So I started freelancing for Curious Pictures in uh, 1996. This is what it looked like back in the day. This is the early uh, department of Curious Pictures. There, I'm standing there all in black as I am wont to do as people who know me. Um, a lot of CRTs and stuff like that. Uh, this is a, a cover story that was done on us back in the day. That's the only reason I know the time period that I worked there. So this was 1997. Um, so this is my first time working at a big studio and they eventually asked me to become uh, staff there and become senior animator. Um, so the interesting takeaways for me from that time period were outside perception. What people outside of Curious Pictures thought of me as I'm talking to, let's say, a software developer to see if I can get an evaluation copy of a plugin. I called them and I said, this is a senior animator of Curious Pictures calling for this. They don't know that I'm, it's just me in the small department now. And that really, it shouldn't be senior animator. It should be senior animator. Um, but they don't know that. I'm not misleading them. They're just assuming, oh, you must be in a huge team. So that was an important thing to realize early on. Uh, I was very idealistic back in back in this time, and uh, some of that was probably not good looking back. Back then, I was all full of fire and this and that. That kind of led to me having some disagreements with some decisions that got made later by management of how the department was going to run. I disagreed with it. The takeaway from this is that I left Curious Pictures, and I left in a very dramatic way. And looking back, I realize now that whenever you, you know, in a case like this where I want to leave a company, even though the, the reason why you want to leave may be valid, the how you leave, 
you can do things in a smart way and a less smart way. I probably did it in a less smart way. Luckily, things turned out fine for me, but there's definitely ways to be smart about making moves in your career. Um, you can do it the diplomatic way or you can do it very dramatically. Anyway, this was that's the takeaway for me there of just kind of sit back and maybe don't be so idealistic and so impetuous. Um, also during this time period, I started teaching. I was asked to teach at Pratt Institute. I was teaching undergrad, which was a great experience. And I was asked to join the discrete training specialist team at Autodesk. Um, the, the history behind the name discrete is a little too long. They bought a company named discrete. Discrete makes Inferno, Flame, Smoke, things like that. And they started using that name for all their entertainment products. That has since changed. It's all back to Autodesk now. But at the time, we were called discrete training specialists. And what was great about this is I got to go around the world meeting you know, software dealers, um, meeting clients, meeting other trainers, and training them. So it really expanded my network and gave me a lot of exposure as an artist, as a, you know, me personally as a representative for Autodesk. So that was all very useful stuff. And I couldn't have done this stuff um, because if, if I hadn't done the user group before and I hadn't done all the demo artist work that I was doing. So I was, by the time I got to this point in my career, I was very comfortable with public speaking. So uh, moving on because we have, we're about halfway through the slides right now. So. I don't want to miss anything. Freelancing, I had to grapple with the idea of like, do I want to be a generalist or a specialist? And I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about that because that's a big subject matter among people in general. But my take on it, it should really be based on your interests. Don't worry about, oh, should I be a generalist or should I be a specialist? That's not an external question, really. I mean, there is an aspect of it that is in that like, well, how much work is there for either, either one of those areas? Is it, are you going to get more work as a specialist or a generalist in the location you're at or the kind of work that's around? Clearly, that's an external question. But really, the root of it should be, what are you interested in? I was a generalist because self-admittedly, I am scatterbrained. I am interested in so many things ever since I was a kid. So I'm not really into just doing one thing and nothing but that. I have too many interests. So that's why I've leaned towards generalist. That is a decision you need to make on your own. Um, another thing that influences that is whether you're, at, you're looking to work for small, medium, or large studios. Um, obviously, a larger studio potentially can be set up much more factory-like where we've got specialists working in different fields and work gets handed across versus a smaller studio, a boutique studio, where you may have less guys working and they're all wearing many hats, in which case generalists tend to be more desirable. Um, this is really not something that I'm gonna, a, a debate or a discussion I'm gonna resolve in this talk, but think about it more based on what your needs as a person are. Um, back then, when I, was, when I first went freelance, I was saying yes to everything. And that's what most people in the industry do. When you're starting out, you never want to turn work down. Every opportunity is precious. Every opportunity is a learning experience. Um, and you've got to pay the bills. And you don't know if next month it's going to be busy. So you, the tendency... For the industry, when people get into this, is you get into this habit of saying yes to everything. Now, that's good, obviously, in the beginning, because you get a lot of experience. Um, you get to work with a lot of different people. You really get to start seeing what you can handle and how much work you can handle. Um, but later, we're going to see there's a flip side to this saying yes to everything. Um, this period of time, I also was approached about writing books. I was approached first about writing chapters for other people's books. And I said, you know, it's not going to hurt my resume to show myself very well-rounded. Let me, let me get some authoring 
uh, credits under my belt. And I was eventually asked to uh, be the lead author on New Writers Inside series for 3DS Max 4. So this is clearly dating myself. Again, this whole talk is dating myself. Um, so I wrote that book. It was a good experience. I swore never to do it again for various reasons, which I don't have time to go into right now. But overall, it was a very good uh, career experience for me. And the funny anecdote for this to take away from this, all this time, what I failed to mention in the beginning of my talk is I dropped out of college. I went to NYU. I dropped out. I went on tour as a guitar tech for rock and roll bands. And my parents have ne had never for forgotten about it. And all this time that I was in, in starting into this industry, they were always saying, oh, why don't you finish college? You ever think about finishing and getting your degree? The minute this book came out and I wrote something really nice, a nice little acknowledgement at the beginning, thanking my parents, all talk of finishing college went out the window. So my joke is always, I should have written a book much earlier. Um, around this time period, I was asked to, to go to Disney feature animation to work on a, a special project. Uh, it was basically the, t the early tests for Nomeo and Juliet, which is, this is a uh, still from one of those. Uh, I still have my ID from that time period. It was a really good opportunity. I got to live in Los Angeles for like three, four months and I work at a big studio. So I got some experience with that. Um, this whole time period, I, I came to the harsh realization and this, this, this phrase that I have there that this is commerce, not art, made it into my book actually. So I should, I probably should have said that before talking about writing books, but I, early on, I realized, you know, there's a difference here. If I'm working as a commercial artist, not necessarily on commercials, but just I'm an artist being paid to make art for people. That this really isn't art. I am someone else's hands. You, your decisions are only important creatively in as far as it satisfies what the client's needs are. And the sooner you realize this when you get into the industry to make money as doing this as a livelihood, the better it is for you. The takeaways is, and you've probably all heard it before, don't let this get too precious to you. This work is not your work. It's someone else's work that you're doing it for them. You don't have to have your ideas all incorporated in there. It's more important to make them happy. So this is a theme that you need to get used to for the rest of your career, unless you're going to be a fine artist. Um, but then the question becomes, well, then how do you do that and maintain artistic integrity or, or satisfaction as an artist if you're always doing something for someone else where they don't really care what you think the direction should be, they care about their direction? Um, this is a theme that we're going to go into, like how you find the ability to do that while being a commercial artist. And we're going to talk more about that. Um, I was lucky that most of the work that I was doing, I was really interested in the subject matter. So in the beginning, it wasn't that hard. Later on, it became more difficult as you didn't really agree with certain things. And we'll, we'll touch on that. Um, and the other key thing to take away from this period of my life and this also goes to the previous slide of working with the salespeople is make friends in all fields. So during this time period, I remember I gave a talk at some organization, I forget the actual name, it was like the, the Guild of Illustrators or something like that. And one of the questions that came up, well, first of all, the audience that I was speaking to was all older than me. They were all senior to me. Um, and they said to us, you know, we're traditional illustrators. We're having a hard time finding work these days because computer graphics have taken over. All the digital, non-traditional stuff is what people are hiring and they're not hiring us anymore. And they asked me, you know, what is your advice? And I said, well, do you guys all know each other in this room? All you Ill traditional illustrators? I'm like, yeah, we're all friends. We all hang out. Okay. And I said, well, stop hanging out with each other. And they were like, well, what do you mean? <laughs> I'm like, I mean, I'm not saying don't be friends, but stop just hanging out with other illustrators. And the example that I gave them was, 
If you're a plumber and you need to get work, do not hang out with other plumbers and nobody, nobody but plumbers, because that's not how you're going to get work. If they find out about a job, they're going to want it. And they're not going to give it to you. But if you hang out with electricians, if you hang out with the guys who do roofing, if you hang out with the guys who put up sheetrock and they get asked by someone, hey, do you know a good plumber? You're going to be the name that they give. Same thing goes for this field. If I'm friends with salespeople, demo artists, if I'm friends with compositors and editors and people who don't do what I do, as well as obviously being friends with other 3D artists, your chances of getting recommended by someone in the network is just skyrockets because the people who don't do what you do have a very short list of people they would recommend that they, they trust to put their name on. And the same goes for you. I'm sure if someone goes to you and you're a 3D artist and say, do you know a good compositor? You're going to have a short list. So the key here is make friends in all fields. Um, so I also want to talk now about the alleged path of a 3D artist. So back in the day, I had been, um, I was at SIGGRAPH down in New Orleans and a buddy of mine said to me, you know, Kim, you're not going to be happy until you move west and go work on a movie. You know, you're not going to be satisfied as an artist until you do that. And I, I, I was just con con contemplating at the time when he told me this. I said, hey, I'm going to take this year-long um, job as a demo artist and a trainer for 3D on the web. There was a company called Pulse 3D back in the day in the early days of the internet where they're trying to do real time rendered 3D on a website. And they're like, why are you doing that? You need to go out West and work on a movie. You're not gonna be happy. And I, and I said, you know what? It really, that's not really true. And I, so I went on to explain, you need to really distill down the basic needs of what your needs are as an artist. Everybody thinks if you're a 3D guy, the path is you work your way up through commercials or TV shows, and then you wind up at the Holy Grail working in Los Angeles or nowadays at Weta or wherever on a big movie, big blockbuster movie. And I said, well, if I distill down, what, what does that do for me? Why is that the way to go? And I distilled it down to these four needs. I need to be challenged creatively and artistically. I need to be challenged technically. I need to be compensated comfortably. And I want the respect from my peers and laymen. Laymen meaning your family, your friends, people not in the industry, right? So if you look at the, this is really the list of all the things get satisfied by working on movies out West. And I'm not saying it's not a good path to take. I'm just saying it's not the only path to take. All of these needs can be satisfied by working on a triple X, a triple A, triple, triple X, that would be interesting. A triple A um, video game from you know, like Ubisoft or Electronic Arts or whoever, pick your game developer, or by a big smash TV show series, an episodic series, or with an amazing commercial that gets done, uh, gets shown on the Super Bowl, or a myriad of other areas that you find will satisfy these four needs. So when people tell you, oh, you should do this, really, you need to boil it down for yourself. And some people's list, the mix of these four things will be different. For some people, the compensation is more important. For some people, it's less. Uh, for some people, the respect from peers is more important and some people less. So the mix of these four needs will change. But generally speaking, this is what it all boils down to when you're considering a career move. Um, which also gets into career direction. What do you want to do? People say, oh, should I take this job? It's not exactly what I was doing before, but it's good pay and this and that. You should be moving in the direction that you want to move. If you want to be a director one day, make moves that are moving in that direction. Uh, if you want to be a technical director one day, move, take you know steps to get you in that direction. If that includes a job doing some coding, maybe that makes sense if you want to be a technical director. Um, so moving on, 
After I freelanced, I just started focusing on my own company that we had started years ago. So let me try to make a, a run of it and start my own, like really start using this company that we set up to do something. And I learned a lot. It was a really good experience. I got to do some really cool stuff like chase commercials that you're seeing here. Got to work on Crime 360 series and mega cities, various commercials like this V8 commercial. I got to direct some stuff like that surcharge commercial um, for Time Warner. Um, I also got to direct a, a, a music video for Chris Rock. So I got to direct Chris Rock. And at one point in my career, I thought, oh, I want to be a director. I realized later, I don't really want to be a director. Um, and this is all stuff because I was uh, stuff that I discovered along the way as I was kind of winging it through my career and winging it through running a studio. We're just taking jobs, taking as many jobs as we could. Um, again, saying yes to everything, but on the company level now, this is where it wasn't so good because you can start really, and this can also be bad as a freelancer too, but I'm, I'm putting it in this section. Um, you can start overextending yourself. And I find through my career and watching other people, it's a very common um, phenomenon that happens for artists. They tend to get into Superman mode. And one of the big things for me was overcoming the Superman complex. And the Superman complex for me is where if you get good at something and you're always succeeding and you're getting fast and everybody's happy with your work, that confidence that it builds tends to make you take on more and more. And you're more willing to say, oh, yeah, I can handle that. Yeah, like I can do. I can juggle these two projects at the same time or vice versa, you know, or three projects or whatever. Um, you start getting really into like, oh, I can do anything, which is a great confidence thing. And it's a great mindset to be in. But it's also very deceiving. And it's going to be a very harsh reality check when things don't go that way. Um, I found that you really need to start looking inside to say things like, what do you really like doing versus what you don't like doing? Uh, taking 3D animation as an example, just in that field alone, there's so many disciplines. You've got modeling, you've got texturing, you've got animation, rigging, effects, all the different aspects that go into um, 3D animation. Um, I realized early on that like, I liked everything because again, I was scatterbrained. I'm interested in a lot of things. But I also realized that there were certain things that I tended to go towards more, like instant gratification disciplines. And those, I mean, modeling, animation, things of that nature, where it's, you want to change the model? Go change the model. It's done. You can see it. Animation, I want to change something. It's immediate. Things I don't consider immediate gratification disciplines would be simulation, lighting, things of that nature, nothing wrong with them, but they're very much, let's try this and let's see what happens and sit and wait. Let's try this, see what happens, sit and wait. I love that stuff as a geek, but I don't enjoy doing it under the pressures of production. So learning what you like and don't like, more importantly, learn what you're good at and not good at. So in, in the context of running a studio, I realized yeah, I'm really good at this 3D stuff. I've got a lot of notoriety. People are sending work my way. And I realized I don't really like running a studio. I don't like running a business. I don't enjoy dealing with the tax forms or dealing with the corporation forms and registry every year or dealing with finding the freelancers or trying to have to chase down the money. So you've got to really, at some point in your career, start taking stock of what you're actually good at. What you think you're good at may not be what you're actually good at. Um, and more importantly, really knowing what you're not good at and being able to admit that. Um, and, and this is a theme that really should be stretching through your whole career. How long does it really take you to do a given task? 
And this is part of the self-awareness part that really that how long it takes you to do a given task should be starting way earlier in your career. Um, and learning how to delegate, realizing that you need help and that you can't do everything, even though you're capable of doing everything, it's not always efficient for you to be doing everything. Um, and learning how to survive failure. No one in any talks ever talks about failure. I'm gonna talk real briefly about mine and this, which made me realize all of this. I took on a job for the company that had to do with a lot of particle systems and I failed to deliver. Thankfully, a buddy of mine who was working at the company that outsourced it was able to cover and get the shots done that I was not, that my company couldn't do. But that was a harsh wake up call for me. Uh, and I didn't just brush it off. I was, it, it affected me emotionally and mentally for a while. Like, oh my God, I failed. And, and you hear the term all the time, failure is not an option. Okay. The truth is it may not be an option, but it's always a possibility. So do not think you're Superman is the takeaway from that. So I'm kind of running out of time and I have a few more to go through. So I'm going to kind of fire through the next one. So at a certain point, I took a break from pure digital and I just left the CG, the pure CG side of it. Now, why did I do that? Well, honestly, I had shifting interest. Again, the scatterbrain part of me, I kind of got bored with stuff, uh, shifting interests. So I started getting interest in electronics. Why else did I leave? I got bored, like I said. I was just kind of like, yeah, okay, another commercial, another of this, another of that. Been there, done that before, let's just do it. Um, and I wasn't pursuing jobs anymore. I wasn't really going out trying to get work. So technically I got lazy and that's my excuse to get my dog into the presentation. So moving on, taking a break from pure digital, what did I do? I wanted to learn something new. I taught myself electronics. That just like 3D, kind of led me down this, this you know, rabbit hole of learning, which led me to CNC machines, which I wound up building one. That's the one that's in my garage right now. Uh, led me into deep into the world of going uh, digital fabrication from digital to fabrication. I already had all the digital. So now I was just learning a new output for it. So instead of rendering to a screen or to a file, I'm rendering to physical objects. Um, and that, kind of got me into all this stuff that you see here. This is a little cross section of stuff that I was doing at the time. And that led me down the new rabbit hole, which was, let me play around with motion control. Let me play around with 3D printing. Let me play around with vacuum forming, mold making, all things that can, that can have 3D skill sets as part of their process. Um, and I did this like robot for Autodesk, uh, quite a few years ago. And that's an example of a finished thing that started digital and was realized and manifested physically. So back to full digital. And we're almost up to present day. We're, we're kind of right here now. Uh, at least part of my day back to full digital. We were talking about balance before. How do you stay satisfied as an artist? So I joined Fuse Effects as a full-time artist. Now I'm working for another company rather than running my own or being a freelancer. Um, the reason I did that is because I knew that the work day was pretty much set to an eight, eight to 10 hour day. And then I wouldn't have to be running a company thinking about the next day and how we're going to track down the money or anything like that. I could just like leave work and say, all right, I don't have to think about fuse effects anymore. Now I can think about my own projects. So that's where I found my balance for having my own artistic integrity and my outlet for making stuff and keeping myself satisfied while still being a commercial artist and doing the whole, you know, this is commerce, not art portion. So the big difference between working for the man and being the man, being the man takes a lot of time and a lot of time that I realized I didn't want to do. And I'm actually fine now working for the man. Um, the business has changed quite a bit. Um, I actually threw this in 
kind of out of order because for people getting into the industry now, it was much easier for my generation to get into this because there wasn't a lot of competition. We were all at the beginning of this new era. Uh, now with, with schools teaching this, there's a lot more competition. So uh, the landscape has changed dramatically from the early days. Uh, so my advice to some of you guys getting into this stuff is you're gonna need to stand out in a very crowded crowd. And a lot of the stuff that we've already talked about, uh, about networking and meeting, meeting people from other areas um, and, and doing it in a personal way, not just online, are all things that are going to feed into allowing you to do this stuff. Uh, people you encounter, you've got to be able to deal with a wide variety of people. Some people you don't like, some people that are not nice or that you disagree with. You're going to have to be able to, to handle that and work with people like this when maybe you don't want to. Um, there's the good, the bad, and the ugly. That's the, the, the range of people that you're going to meet. Um, and realize that your focus and interests are going to change and that you need to somehow keep the dots connected. For me today, keeping the dots connected, I have all this 3D skill set, but my interests have changed. I'm interested in building things these days while well, I'm just incorporating it into my work, um, doing cloth simulations to make furniture, um, creating things on the computer and designing it on the computer to build. These are personal projects of mine that I'm showing you. But I'm connecting the dots because 3D is still involved in all these projects. Um, so to wrap it up, I know I might be going a little over. Um, lessons learned is the last two slides. Here's my list of do's. Do be self-aware. And, and part of that is knowing what you're good at and what you like. Be nice. I know that sounds so basic, but people will hire you and hire you back if you're, you're a pleasure to work with versus someone who is full of themselves, hence this next one, be humble. Um, if I'm given a choice between hiring a guy who's amazing at a certain discipline, but he's a, he's a diva, and a guy who's not quite as good, but is a joy to be around, I'm going to want to bring that person on uh, in most cases, not in every case. Um, uh, this be humble humility, humility file that I have here. Early in my career, I created a file in my file cabinet, physical file cabinet called the humility file. And in it, I have all of my rejection letters. <clears throat> be well-rounded, find balance in life and in CG, listen more talk less, find the positives in every circumstances if you can, and make friends in other areas or vertical markets. I'm speaking to what I spoke to before. And here's the do not list. Do not misrepresent yourself. Just be honest about what you do know how to do and what you've done in the past. It, it, it's, you're not fooling anyone and they're going to find out. Don't be a diva. No one likes working with a diva. In other words, don't be a dick. Be, don't be closed-minded. Do not be closed-minded. Be open-minded to other people's approaches and ideas. Don't be afraid to ask questions. That's a big one through your whole career. When you're starting out, there's no shame in not knowing something. Always, don't always be the first to talk. That goes with listen more. And do not panic or jump to conclusions when crises arise. And here's my last slide and it's kind of showing you that old terms and old sayings are very pertinent today it is a small world and an even smaller industry be wary of that it takes years to build a good reputation it can take a minute to destroy it i've seen it happen you can catch fly more flies with honey than vinegar this is specifically out to the more senior people don't be a yeller don't pull don't there. I'm not going to name names of like famous people who, who are known to do that, but the people working under you are on your team. You don't need to yell at them. If the pressure's on, everyone's feeling the pressure. There are other ways to get what you want. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. That's kind of with networking. 
just have a, a vast network if you can meet everybody there's strength in numbers always maintain a paper trail to cover yourself because if a client asks you for stuff make sure you get it in writing make sure you have a paper trail to say no you asked me to do this two weeks ago now you're changing your mind don't count your chickens before they hatch if you think a project's going to happen you don't know it's going to happen until you're really getting paid to do it don't assume things will fall into place even they though they look like a sure thing because there is no such thing as a sure thing and most important, remember there's always gonna be someone better than you. I am not God's gift to CG. Most of us are not. So always have a little bit of humility in what you do. So with that, thank you for watching. Go forth and make cool stuff. And most importantly, don't be an asshole. Nice. Awesome, <laughs> thank you, Kim, that was super informative fantastic amount of knowledge there very much appreciate you uh sharing with us your experience and everything it's been an amazing yeah sorry if i went over <laughs> no that's that is par for the course i mean it is one of those deals so i mean ultimately you know that's the way it is so thank you very much appreciate everybody joining us and hope you have a good time uh the rest of the the sunday and uh, we'll talk to you out there see you out there for sure